Well, the U.S. has repeatedly shielded its ally, Israel, at the U.N. Security Council. Eleven days into the war, it blocked a resolution that Brazil had tabled, calling for humanitarian pauses to allow U.N. agencies safe access to Gaza. The U.S. said it was prioritizing diplomatic efforts on the ground. At the time, Israeli bombardment had killed 3,500 Palestinians. In December, it blocked a resolution put forward by the United Arab Emirates, calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. The U.S. said this would only plant the seeds for the next war. 17,500 Palestinians had been killed. In February, the U.S. rejected a resolution drafted by Algeria demanding an immediate ceasefire. Instead, it pushed for a temporary truce tied to the release of Israeli captives. It said a ceasefire could jeopardize negotiations. Israeli attacks had killed more than 29,000 Palestinians. We're going to bring in Al Jazeera senior political analyst Marwan Bashara. He's in London. He's with us uh, live. When you look at the timeline of that, Marwan, and the, uh, the fact that when the U.S. has been blocking these efforts to try to find either a, a, a pause or for humanitarian aid or for a, a ceasefire, every time the numbers of Palestinians who die goes up. In terms of the allegations of complicity and genocide, that makes it, I would imagine, more and more difficult for the U.S. to defend itself. Yes, there's no doubt about that. And by the way, this is an excellent and damning chronology that you just uh, showed there. And it tells you really, uh, period by period, how the United States complicity, indeed partnership uh, with Israel in the carrying of a genocide in Gaza, uh, has re actually, actually contributed to the actual augmentation of the casualties uh, among the Palestinians. So there's absolutely no doubt, especially in the first six months through the end of March, but really the whole year of American partnership driving the war against Gaza through the arming, financing and shielding of Israel. Now, if you look at your previous two reports, by the way, which are excellent reports in summarizing the year uh, and this, you know, what we view as journalists, as academics, as observers to be double standards and hypocrisy and the importance of human rights in all of this, because as journalists, in the end of the day, that's what it's all about, what's what's right and what's good for people, right? But, and here I think is where we need to have that added value analysis on where is this all coming from? Why is the United States so hypocritical? Why do we see it that way? Why are we calling it out on it? Look, in Washington, they don't think of themselves as hypocritical. In London, they don't think of themselves as hypocritical. They don't think of it as double standards. So what we show and the paradox and the contrast, for them, it's, it's nonsensical. Because for them, there is one standard, not double standard. And that one standard is their interest, their imperial interest, their power interest, their state interest. That's the interest they pursue. And if the interest is with Israel against the Palestinians and the Lebanese and the Iranians, well, let it be. If their interest is with the Ukrainians against the Russians, so be it. If they're interested again with the Taiwanese against the Chinese, here you go. So it's, it's not even about racism against the Palestinians, although I'm sure there's a large degree of racism involved here. It's not that Palestinian life is less important than Ukrainian life. That's how we see it. For them, it's about the actor, not the acted upon. It's not even about the act. It's about the actor. Russians are bad. Israelis are good. Iranians are bad, Chinese are bad, English are great, French are wonderful. So your partners and allies are great. Your adversaries and nemesis are horrific and evil. We were talking a moment ago to Noor Erekat, a professor at Rutgers University. She specializes in humanitarian cases. Uh, she was making the distinction that, of course, Israel regard, will defend the number of Palestinian deaths as essentially collateral damage. And she was saying this is not coincidence. These are not people being caught in the crossfire. These are, as she put it, targeted attacks. And that, I would imagine, changes the whole dynamic of any argument with regard to a defense against genocide. Well, I'll tell you, so since we are doing the year uh, review or in review, uh, let me go back to the first week of the, of, of the war on Gaza, where I've written and I've spoken to you about 
uh, how the case for genocide was being manufactured in the first few days of the war. And why, hence, analytically speaking, I mean, this is not accusation, analytically speaking, the war was war on Gaza, not war on Hamas, in the sense that Gaza had to be destroyed and Hamas would have to be destroyed in the process. And a number of things need to happen. But destroying Gaza was important. And that's why the case for genocide, like, like by the comparing uh, Gaza to ISIS, and why saying there is no one innocent in Gaza, and they are human animals. It was all to pave the way for the destruction of Gaza. And hence, Hamas was the collateral damage. The target, in fact, of the war, the objective, was the destruction of Gaza and the killing of its people. Mm. Hamas fighters, they died as collateral damage. And hence, this incredible discrepancy between how many civilians, how many children have died, and how much fewer Hamas fighters have died. In the end of the day, when you bomb residential buildings and hospitals and schools and universities, what you are targeting are the people not the fighters who are hiding in the tunnels. It's been repeatedly said, in, particularly in recent months, that Joe Biden no longer has any influence over Benjamin Netanyahu anymore, that Netanyahu is essentially, as his critics would say, is out of control and nobody can influence it. But nevertheless, the, the level of weaponry that the U.S. is supplying to uh, Israel must give some leverage somewhere. Looking at the way that the, uh, the U.S. is, for example, trying to influence in its targets, for example, in Iran, or the way that it handles its fighting with Hezbollah, do you think, in fact, that the U.S. is using that leverage, but is using it judiciously? Gaza doesn't really matter so much, but other parts do. That's interesting. Um, look, uh, as it were, the proof is in the pudding, right? In the end of the day, if it's true, there was not much wrangling behind the scenes and there was a lot of pressure in the dark rooms, then we would have seen it come through. It didn't come through. We've seen Netanyahu insist on the land invasion and he got it, and the invasion of Rafah and he got it. In, uh, in cutting and blocking humanitarian aid, humanitarian aid, he got it. In widening the war, he got that. In widening the war against Lebanon, he certainly got that. In carrying mass terrorist attacks against the Lebanese, he got that. In carrying assassination throughout the region from Syria to Lebanon to Iran, he got that. So I don't know what leverage Biden has using. It certainly has not worked. Now, look, it's important to say what needs to be said. The American president certainly has leverage. Don't any, let anyone fool you by saying, well, you know, Netanyahu can do whatever he wants. The Zionist control. No. The empire has leverage over its rogue client, even if it's Israel with a huge lobby in the United States. If the American interests are at stake, as they were a number of times, an American president could step up and say, shut up and set up and listen to what America is telling you. Otherwise, we're going to cut the aid, we're going to cut the arms, and we're going to cut you out at the UN Security Council, and we're going to leave you to the international community to deal with you. No American president is doing that, and certainly not Biden, the self-declared Zionist, right? So I think the Biden administration is trying to have its cake and eat it too. It's trying to support Israel in its war against Lebanon and Gaza and in the Middle East to achieve its supremacy, regional supremacy, and at the same time playing the human rights card, playing that it is actually a case for human life, that human rights is at the center of its own policy. BS. Marwan, thank you very much indeed. That's from Marwan Bashara, our Al Jazeera's senior political analyst. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.